you know, there's all sorts of personal and direct and immediate reasons why a topic like this is useful, but let's make sure that we, you know, acknowledge and honor that while at the same time expanding the motivation to the highest possible motivation, which is enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, then all of our other goals will be achieved as a byproduct. So we'll set our motivation using refuge in bodhicitta, and then we'll read the Heart Sutra just to make sure that we're not grasping at ourself or the teachings or anything is inherently existent to kind of get rid of any kind of tight or dogmatic thinking before we even begin. So we'll just do a couple prayers and then we'll jump into the actual content. So starting with refuge in bodhicitta. Sangay churum so ki churam la, John Chopadu dane gapsuchi, Dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki, Troll up and cheer sangay drupa show. And just sitting with the meaning for a moment, letting it sink in and resonate. And then the Heart Sutra. Who I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on massive vultures mount in Rajagriya together with the great community of monks, the great community of bodhisattvas. At that time the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom, beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariput said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasa, Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the productivity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokitesh said this to the venerable Shariputra, Putra, Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeat beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unsustainless, not without, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no 
discrimination, no compositional fact, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of foot, touch, and no phenomena. There is no I element and so on up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on up and to and including no aging and, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attain, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom. The mind without obscuration and without having completely Pass beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who in the three times also manifestly completely awake to unsurpassable, perfect, complete, enlightened in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. For the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra the thorough pacifies all suffer should be known as true since it is not the mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared Taihata Gate Gate Parai Gate Parasam Gate Bodhi Soha Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasa, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. The Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commit the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara say, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like, it is like that one should practice the profound perfect of wisdom just as you have indicated even the tatagatas rejoice that bhagavan having thus spoke the venerable sharivati put the bodhisattva mahasattva arya avalokiteshvara and those surrounding in their entirety along with the world god's humans asuras and others were overjoyed and highly Praise that spoken by the Bhagavan. I prostrate to the gathering of Dakinis in the three chakras who abide in the holy yoga of using space. By your powers of clairvoyance and magical emanation, look after practitioners like a mother, her child. Aka Samara Sundara. Aka Samara Sundara. By the teachings of the supreme jewels possessing the power of truth, may inner and outer hindrances be transformed. May they be dispelled. May they be pacified. Shintum kurie soha. May all negative forces opposed to dharma be completely pacified. May the host of 80,000 obstacles be pacified. May we be separated from problems and harmful conditions to dharma. May all enjoyments be in accord with the Dharma, and may there be auspiciousness and perfect happiness here right now. Okay, so of course the Heart Sutra is never going to go out of style and is a very useful way to get us to kind of shake our head clear of any kind of fundamentalist thinking, to shake our head clear of assuming we know what is reality to kind of cut through all of the deceptive characteristics of conventional truth, which is that things appear to be truly existent when the opposite is the case. So um, go the Heart Sutra, um, especially on a day like today. 
And I think the, the delicate thing that we're going to navigate in this course and the delicate thing we're going to navigate in this life is how to fully embrace ethics, fully embrace loving kindness, fully embrace compassion, while at the same time holding the fact that all of these things are merely labeled by the mind and are completely empty of inherent existence. And if we fall too much one way or the other, um, our practice is going to be lopsided and there's going to be a lot of um, frustration and a lot of inner and outer conflict with how we see and act within the world. So if you go too much wisdom, you get a bit cold and a bit maybe spiritual bypassing. If you go too much method, you can get a little bit too sweet or a little bit less skillful. So if we are always remembering that method and wisdom need to be combined, then we're in the best position to practice without mistakes. So um, the topic is transforming problems, which really means we're going to be talking about lojong. And um, just kind of so I have a general sense of it, can you give me a little wave if you've done some lojong thought transformation teachings of some kind, like eight verses or seven point mind training? You have kind of a vague <laughs> or a very clear sense of that genre of Buddhist thought. Some thumbs ups, some waves. Totally new to a few people. Yeah, okay. Yep, so we got maybe half and half. Um, and, you know, I think the thing about lojong, which is a Buddhist term, meaning thought transformation or mind training, lojong really is referring to the fact that your mind has everything it needs to find happiness and it has everything it needs in the external world to use as fuel to open the heart. So it's very empowering to look at mind training teachings, but they are incredibly confronting and they're very radical reframing. You know, if you've ever done any kind of psychology or any kind of therapy, you know, maybe CBT or something, there's a lot of encouragement to, you know, see things as an opportunity for growth, right? Or your parents told you, you know, tough things are good for you. It builds character. You know, this sort of thinking isn't brand new to us. It exists in society, you know, unrelated to Dharma, the idea that you can reframe your situation. I think what's unique here is there can be there can be a way of thinking in the world where whenever difficulty arises, you think it's a lesson being given to you by a higher power, like specifically for you. Whereas in the mind training tradition, it's a decision. Yeah, that the difficulty and hardship in your life, you can decide is a lesson rather than it's something bestowed upon you that you either take on well or not. It's not a cross to bear. It's not a lesson that's been given. It's your choice to make what's happening transformative. So this way of thinking is incredibly empowering because whether you believe in a higher power or not, it can be useful. You can be a total atheist and thought transformation ideas will still work. Now, if you do have some sense of maybe the divine or God or Buddhism bodhisattvas or some sort of higher power that does want you to open your heart and to transform your mind and is doing the best it can to get through to you, given your own obscurations, that of course will add to the practice. But it's not essential for the practice to work, at least in terms of immediate stress relief and ongoing transformation within one life. So there's a secular and a spiritual way to look at the same set of teachings, and it's totally up to you how you hear it and how you practice it. Um, I think the danger in studying the Lojong teachings is that because they make sense logically and we like the idea of them, we adopt the attitude that it's already what we believe and kind of jump over our real life troubles. So for example, you might think uh, my difficult 
boss is my teacher. I'm deciding that they're my teacher and everything difficult they do is a great learning and transformation for me. And I'm just, I feel really grateful for the opportunity to have this horrible person in my life so that I can really build some character, patience, compassion. Yay for my difficult boss. And you know, that's the way you want your mind to go. So you pretend that's where it already is. So in order to close the gap, you need to have this habit of very kind self-awareness that really is honest with what am I actually feeling? What am I actually thinking? And then how can I marry that up to what I want to think and what I want to feel without forcing it? We need to remember that all wisdom teachings are going to be understood intellectually way before they can be integrated emotionally or spiritually or however you want to frame it. So to think of it like a funnel, you know, like you've got this funnel of knowledge above the, above the crown of your head and it's getting fed in and there's tons of stuff that you know at the top that can only trickle down through that tiny opening drop by drop to actually touch your heart and change your behavior. So if you're feeling like just because you understand it, you already should be able to live it, then you're going to always be disappointed in yourself. Yeah. Or you're going to be defensive and annoyed when people call you out on not practicing what you preach. Or <laughs> you're going to become a glassy eyed fanatic and pretend that you really feel what you don't feel and um, become a little bit plastic and unbearable to be around. Right, so those are the dangers, okay? And I think we already know that, but just to kind of name them right from the very beginning and before we even get into the content, that just because it makes sense doesn't mean that we need to already be amazing at doing it. Yeah. So Lojong teachings, of course, come from Buddha Shakyamuni, um, but they're far more implicit in his actual teachings during his actual life. The Lojong thought transformation mind training teachings were kind of more explicitly revealed by Nagarjuna. So some of you guys know about Nagarjuna and how awesome he is. And um, some of you don't, and it's totally fine. But basically just know that Nagarjuna was one of these Nalanda masters. He's very famous for um, kind of developing the Mahayana tradition, excuse me, in the middle way tenant school, which is the school of thought that we adhere to. So between kind of 150 and 250 common era, somewhere around there is where we think Nagarjuna um, was alive. And what he said was right here, he said, may their negative, negative fruits ripen upon me. May my positive fruits ripen upon them. Can you see that in the italics? So that is the basis for the whole thought transformation tradition. Yeah, and it's kind of explicitly pulled out and um, given to us as an invitation within one of our most popular practices in the Gaelic tradition, the Lama Chippa, Guru Puja. And it's in verse 96, which says, and thus, perfect, pure, compassionate Guru, I seek your blessings that all negativities, obscurations, and sufferings of mother migrators may without exception ripen upon me right now, and that by giving my happiness and virtue to others, all migrators may experience happiness. So this is kind of the summary of the Tonglin practice, the summary of the giving and taking practice, which is at the heart of Lojong. Okay, so, you know, these Tibetan words can get a little bit kind of, I don't know, unwieldy and a little bit unfamiliar right at first. But if you can get your head around them, then when you see varied translation choices, you won't be confused. So Lojong, thought transformation. Tonglen, giving and taking or taking and giving. Yeah, so Lojong and Tonglen. Lojong is the big umbrella category of thought transformation teachings. Tonglen is the specific practice of how to do that. And there are many, many texts that direct you to do this giving and taking practice. Have some of you heard about Tonglen before giving and taking practice? Yeah. Does anyone feel confident to give their, um, their sense of what the practice is? 
just a little colloquial, you know, not too fancy explanation. What is Tonglen? Deb says, breathe in the nasty, breathe out the love. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice summary. <laughs> yep, that's going in the right direction. Would anyone like to add to that? I like taking in the black smoke and breathing out the white smoke. I like that visual image. Yep, yep, that's exactly the, the image that you go with. Yep. Um, it is very easily misunderstood, this practice. And this idea that you're breathing in gross, yucky suffering, and that you think that it is taking the form of heavy black smoke, polluted tar, just like breathing it into your lungs, right? The very opposite of what you would want to do. And then you're breathing out maybe white smoke or white light or golden light, and you're sending it out. And the two ideas that go with that is I'm taking on suffering and I'm giving over my happiness. It should hit as counterintuitive. Yeah, it should hit as I would rather not do that. <laughs> you know, like what a nice idea for me to be a little filtration system for all sentient things. But honestly, uh, you know, it, it's supposed to make us cringe a little bit and go, I don't want to. Um, and part of the Tonglen practice is mentally overcoming our resistance to our own suffering and observing the suffering of others and wanting to be of benefit to the suffering of others. So it's a mental attitude. One of the reasons why the Tonglen practice can be misunderstood is that maybe we've heard of stories where it happened literally. Like there's a story from the previous Karmapa, the head of the Kagyu tradition, where as he was dying, he manifested all sorts of different diseases. Like first he had cancer and then he had some sort of skin disease and then he had this and then he had that. And he was showing the aspect of having many different diseases, all of which his students had the predispositions for and he was literally taking their suffering on himself and literally purifying them. We may have heard stories like this yeah, we might have heard um, in Cave in the Snow um, about Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo, about um, I think boiling water fell on her hand and her mother so much wanted to take the suffering of the burn that um, she literally did and Jetsuma no longer had burnt skin. Okay, so these are the special, special cases related to when people have very strong karma with one another and have created the cause to be healed in that way. So one of the things we know about karma is that you can't transfer karma. You can't actually take someone's karma and you can't actually give them yours. It doesn't work that way. But what you can do is become an incredibly powerful condition for their karma to ripen in various ways. Do you know what I mean? So for example, with our loved ones, if our loved one who likes physical contact is crying and we give them a hug, that's a condition for their mind to be soothed. But it's not the substantial cause, otherwise every single time we hug them, it would always work exactly the same, right? And sometimes they're like, get off me, <laughs> right? So it's not like the hug is giving comfort directly, it's a condition for comfort to be experienced by them, but they have the substantial cause within their own mental continuum. Okay, so this is really important kind of background knowledge about giving and taking is that we can't actually take each other's karma or give our karma to them, but we adopt this mental attitude. Why? What's the benefit of thinking I want to take my own, my future, and everyone else's suffering? I want to take it. What is the benefit in thinking that way? It sounds crazy. It sounds like martyrdom. What's the benefit of thinking that way? Just kind of if you're ruminating. Yeah, Petra. I've only done the meditation, you know, a number of times. So it, it, it's, they say something about like it shatters, it's supposed to shatter my ego or uh, walls around the heart, something like that. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a way of dissolving the barrier 
that blocks your good heart from getting to people, you know, in a very colloquial way of explaining. What it really does is it destroys self-cherishing, negative self-cherishing. So self-cherishing from a Buddhist perspective is viewing the I and thinking it is of primary importance at the expense of others or with indifference to others. And it's closely related to self-grasping, but they're actually different things. Self-grasping ignorance, for example, the self-grasping ignorance that is the root of samsara, that's viewing that I and holding it to exist inherently, which is, you know, the root of all the trouble, right? That's the root of samsara. Self-cherishing is like its best friend. It sees that false sense of self and says, I must protect you and I must gather things to you that help and that you like and push away things from you that are damaging and dangerous. And the self-cherishing is really the main thing that's giving us an agitated mind. You know, the agitated mind that says, this is all too much or this is all not enough. Yeah, the mind that says more of this, less of that, more of this, less of that. That underlying agitation in the mind that is really self-cherishing, then blossoming into attachment, blossoming into, you know, further ignorance, blossoming into anger, et cetera, et cetera. So self-grasping and self-cherishing are best friends, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, Tonglen destroys self-cherishing. Yeah. It destroys self-cherishing by cultivating bodhicitta. And bodhicitta is the direct antidote to self-cherishing. Do you guys remember what bodhicitta is? <laughs> Have we got a heart? Yes, you remember what bodhicitta is? Maybe you have a sense of it being, I don't know, altruism or kindness. Yeah. Uh, bodhicitta is really the main Mahayana motivation, right? It's the main Mahayana motivation, which is the aspiration to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And when it's in its fully qualified form, it's uncontrived, it's direct, it's imbued with the determination to be free. But we can... But we can have it already in a contrived form, which is still incredibly beneficial. If you just take a moment and stop and think, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you think that in an intellectual way, and then you try and let it pull down to your heart and think, yeah, actually that is the purpose of my life. That is the purpose of my spiritual path. The whole point of this both happiness and suffering, is to channel all of my existence, all of my experiences, all of my learning into developing my fullest potential. And from that place, I can be of greatest benefit to others. That is the point of all of this. And so in order to have bodhicitta, we have to look at what stands in opposition to it, what blocks it, right? And what blocks it is the self-cherishing thought. So we have this beautiful heart that has love, that has compassion, but is a little bit biased about it. Like, I'm going to love and have compassion to the people what are nice to me and I think are fun. You know, I'm going to radiate compassion to my radius of us. And anyone that falls outside the circle of us that falls into an idea of them, they're not getting the love so much, or maybe they're getting a watered down version of it. Maybe they just get politeness, <laughs> you know, and then the next level out, maybe they just get disinterest. And hopefully no one gets anger and rage because I'm someone on a spiritual path trying to work on myself. But, you know, we do have a little bit of like, just you lot here, get the good stuff and you lot here, sorry. Yeah. And so it's self-cherishing that gives us those walls. You know, are you going to run out of loving kindness and compassion? No way. But if they are mixed with attachment, of course you are. 
because attachment's going to give you a sense of deprivation. You know, I give and I give and I give and I have nothing left. That's attachment, right? That's attachment because it's exaggerating outcomes and it's putting pressure and expectation on the love or the compassion. And those things really can't come about in that way, right? So we want to kind of get ourselves geared up for the idea that Tonglin is a good idea or, or that developing bodhicitta is a good idea for ourselves, for our loved ones, and for all sentient beings. What would happen if our governments, if our society, if our family, if our friendship group was motivated by altruism? Wouldn't you as an individual benefit from that? Yeah, if everyone was altruistically motivated, all individuals within that would be benefited. When the opposite is true, when you think me first, or America first, or Israel first, then everyone else, does that benefit the whole of society? And does that wind up benefiting the individual? You know, when we were still able to travel, was it fun to be a foreigner if you were an American traveling to other countries in the last few years? <laughs> other countries were not as happy to see us as they have been in previous years. And perhaps rightly so, right? Because we're saying me first, me first, and everyone is like, all right, what makes you so special? Yeah. When, if, when it's kind of us, the individual benefits, when it's me, the individual actually is at a loss. And, you know, we know this logically, but then when it comes to making decisions, especially decisions that are under the pressure of stress, we forget and say, yeah, yeah, generally altruism, but right now me, right down my family. Yeah, and we forget that that thinking does the individual a disservice and does society a disservice. It's self-cherishing that makes us short-sighted or blinkered or have a really small vision of life that says, I just need to get through the day or I just need to do this for me. And then when I have mental space, I'll expand. And it's very hard to get yourself out of that logic because there is a grain of truth to it. Yeah, you do need to look after yourself. You didn't do need to look after today. But what happens is that once you think of others and you think of the big picture and you think of the long term, you have less pressure. And when you have less pressure on you, you're much more relaxed. So it's counterintuitive, and that's why it's so useful to do Tonglen, because it is the opposite of what self-cherishing wants us to do, and it helps us break the habit of self-cherishing. We do it on the cushion, and then we get off the cushion and do it in our daily life. I am a little bit of a mind training nerd, okay? So I love Lojong so much, I could not just settle down on using just one mind training verse. I kind of wanted to cherry pick a little bit because it's all of a piece and use aspects of lots of different mind training verses. So Lee sent you the links for the main text that I'll be using, but um, don't feel like you need to read them all unless you're really curious. I just wanted to make sure that you had them in case one particular set really kind of sparked your interest and you wanted to look into it more deeply. So the, the ones that I'm going to be looking at today with you guys is basically Eight Verses of Thought Transformation by Geshe Lungri Tampa and the Seven Point Mind Training of Geshe Chikawa. So those two I'm going to be looking at this session. And then next Wednesday, we're going to look a little bit more on Shanti Deva's Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life and Dharma Rakshita's Wheel of Sharp Weapons. So I'll just be kind of taking the bits that seem most relevant in this day and age um, and just kind of starting to work with them in this way. So I'm going to look at seven point mind training using a little bit more from Lama Chopa, just because I think the verses are particularly beautiful and just see what you think. The first one I think is particularly relevant for a lot of the things happening today. Um, and it says, even if the environment and beings are filled with the fruits of negativity and unwished for sufferings pour down like rain, I seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path by seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of my negative karma. 
So there's a lot to unpack there, but just kind of sit with that verse 96 for a second. Even if the environment and beings are filled with the fruits of negativity, what does that mean? That means their past negative karma is ripening as suffering. And it is also ripening as the causally concordant effect, which is bad behavior. Okay, so what's happening right now in the world and what's happening all the time for samsaric beings is that the past is ripening. Sometimes the past is ripening as happiness. Sometimes the past is ripening as suffering. But the problem is that when things are in front of us, like suffering and hardship and bad behavior, we forget that it's conditioned from times before and we think it's all about right now. And then we try and manipulate conditions and circumstances related to exactly this moment. Historians or any number of intelligent people would say what? Those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it, right? It's not like this is the same thing, you know, anything particularly different than has ever come before. It just feels new to us because we forgot our history or it feels new to us because we're in a country where it's not as common or something like this. And the difficulty becomes that we rush to think, how can I do symptoms relief and put a band-aid on the suffering of this moment, forgetting about the underlying causes? And it's a very natural human response to say, let's just squash it and deal with what caused it later. Yeah, and the squashing energy usually involves dominance and violence, doesn't it? And maybe there is an argument for that occasionally historically being the skillful approach, maybe. I would, I would argue that not even then, but maybe. But what happens when you remedy a wrong with a wrong is that you are successful for a minute, right? When you meet violence with violence in a minute, you can dominate the harmer by being a bigger harmer. You can, you can win for a second. You know, think about it in the context of an argument. You can win an argument by being dominant and aggressive, but have you really won the argument or if you just made someone shut up? And then there's aggression in their heart and then there's sadness in their heart and where is that gonna go? Are they gonna take it out on their partner? Are they gonna take it out on the poor cashier at the grocery store? What are they gonna do with that ball of energy from having been dominated and squashed in that way? It's gonna leak out somewhere else. So what happens with the self-cherishing thought is that because we're so short-sighted and we're thinking in such the short term, we think, I just need to fix this now and deal with why later. And it takes a really spacious, really patient mind to ask, what is the suffering underneath the bad behavior? And how can I address the suffering and kind of rob the bad behavior of its fuel rather than just try and squash the bad behavior, right? So it's, it's robbing the bad behavior of fuel rather than squashing it with more pressure. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when we're looking at what's happening right now, that this is the result of habit. This is the result of mental habit. This is the result of physical habit. And there is a lot of years and a lot of centuries and a lot of eons driving people's choices today. Yeah, it's not like they just suddenly decided to be violent out of nowhere. And it's not, it's not as if using our same old methods to combat it are going to lead to something new. It's hard to know what the right solution is, but we can ask ourselves, am I worse? Yeah. So who did we talk to today? By text message, by email, by phone, by face-to-face, -face. who did we talk to today? Probably we talked to people with a lot of anxiety and agitation and what's going on and what should we do and how could this happen? And on top of the anxiety it was perhaps some very understandable anger. And anger is of course very natural, but it's not necessary. Yeah, just because it comes naturally doesn't mean it's necessary. 
just because something is vivid doesn't make it true. Yeah, just because we feel something viscerally in our bones, I must act from this place of rage at injustice. Yeah, just because it's vivid doesn't make it true. You know, the old example in Buddhism that we talk about when discussing reality, if you walk down a path at twilight and you see a coiled rope, but you think it's a snake, you can be just as scared as if it were actually a snake. Yeah, so just because you feel something intensely doesn't mean it's based in truth, right? So we need enough spaciousness to check, okay, my emotional response is a conditioned response coming from the past. Is it useful? Is it necessary? It's totally true that I'm feeling it and I need compassion for myself and to hold the space for myself. This is a really uncomfortable feeling, but that doesn't mean that what it's saying is truth or that the actions it dictates are accurate. You know, we need enough mental space to be able to catch it and check. Yeah. So the verse is really inviting us to choose to take this as a path of, okay, even if I'm not sure what to do with society or the government, what can I do with my friends and my family so that I'm kind of robbing aggression of having more fuel? Yeah, maybe some of my friends need to vent and they're just on a roll with their anger and their aggression and they just need me to hold the space compassionately while they, you know, say what they're going to say. But what I can do is choose not to add uh, what's more is, did you hear this? <laughs> you know, we can choose not to add to it or to give it more momentum. We can just hear they are suffering with this knowledge. I can hold the space for their suffering. Yeah. And maybe that's one less person with aggression at the end of a conversation with me. And maybe that has a ripple effect in this world. You know, if all of us decided to take care of our friends and family and coworker group to manage the aggression and combativeness, that would have an amazing result. So, you know, so we have to really take responsibility and also feel empowered that us as one tiny little person in this world still does have an impact. You know, to say, it doesn't matter, I'm just one person, that's what we're all saying. And then, you know, here's the result, you know, so just very gently ask ourselves, what can I do to bring peace? And maybe it's only how can I bring myself some peace? So the little space I physically occupy is not one more agitated area. Yeah, maybe that's all you can do, but it's still incredibly significant. If someone is very upset and they walk into your house, you can feel it. We can also feel it if someone walks into your house with full of peace and happiness and centeredness and compassion, it just may be less obvious because it's pleasant. <laughs> you know, we're much more aware of the unpleasant. So, you know, we can be the one that kind of lifts the energy of the household that we reside in. You know, at least the cats will benefit, right? <laughs> or the dogs. But, you know, to think these things really do have a ripple effect and are important to look at. Okay, so the invitation of this verse, I think, can be really profound. And, uh, you know, I think of all of the ones we're going to talk about today, I think this one is really, really relevant. So unwished for suffering. So you're not pretending that you wanted this to happen, right? They're unwished for sufferings. But I seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path, seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of my negative karma. So the way to unpack those last two lines is first to decide I'm going to see these miserable conditions as a path to transformation, to altruism. But I'm also going to see that every time I have suffering and I bear it well, I'm finishing old negative karma. Yeah, I'm finishing old negative karma. So, you know, some people might kind of make a shortcut and say they're purifying. <laughs> purifying is a much more active on purpose act, right? You sit down and you do your four opponent powers and your Vajrasattva practice and you try and burn your old negative seeds so that they don't produce the fruit of suffering. What also happens is you're suffering during the day anyway. It's too late. Those seeds are ripening. What do you do so you don't create more? You bear them well. Does it make sense? 
Yeah, so you choose to react differently than your same old pattern. Yeah, and you know, we'll fall short and we'll forget and that's normal and human, but just gently, gently, whatever your capacity is, try to respond from a spiritual path, right? But Uden responding from, you know, old self-cherishing once again. Yeah. Um, questions? Yeah, Scott. I, there, there's another piece to, to stopping the, the negative feelings, and that is the business of carrying those feelings to other people. So, you know, someone else, you know, you know so you're negative and you bring, take the negative, negativity to someone else, to someone else, to someone else. And that has a whole different sort of texture to it now in the context of social media, because you can push a button and make 100,000 people's views negative in such an easy sort of way. So it, it isn't entirely a personal thing. Now there's a piece of it that is kind of outside of you. And I, um, I, I struggle with how to maintain that and how to keep from doing that. Well, I mean, you're, you're naming the problem. I think, you know, um, save to draft is our best friend in email, right? That's our best friend button, save to draft. And then, you know, in terms of social media, I think one very useful thing on social media is to break the spell that says it is urgent that I respond. It's not urgent, it's an illusion. Yeah, urgency is an illusion given to us by attachment. It says, because someone said this, I must say this <laughs> right now because they are wrong. It's like they were wrong before you read it and they'll be wrong after you leave. And if you tell them something, is it true that a heart-centered reasoned analysis presented logically always works, <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes we read something on social media and we think, look, if they only knew, they'd change their mind. I'll give them an excellent logical syllogism. I'll give them a brilliant link from a credible source. I'll give them a funny meme to bring the point home and then their minds will change. Unlikely, right? <laughs> But part of us thinks that when we're looking at social media, we think we can change someone's mind through the force of a reasoned argument or through dominance or through humor. And every once in a while we can, person to person, heart to heart as an individual. But usually what winds up happening is we just increase the agitated vibe. You know, and I think that our life will prove that to us, <laughs> you know, right? How many times has our mind been changed? A few times, maybe. Has it been when someone has forced a reason upon us or has it been when we were 90% there anyway? And they offered us that little 10% that brought us the next way. You know, how often do people hear advice that has not been asked for, <laughs> you know? And so, so I think if we can take a step back and ask, what is my goal here? You know, all communication has a goal, even if we're not aware of it. What is the goal of my communication? Will this goal be facilitated by what I'm about to say? Let's sit with it, you know? And uh, there's a lot to be said for waiting five minutes before you respond to anything, waiting five days, waiting five years, but you know, like wait a minute and, and try and break that, that feeling of urgency that can happen when you're online with people. That's, that's attachment talking. That's not wisdom. Yeah. The illusion of urgency. I've been enjoying the talk. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciated what you said around uh, holding space for some people because I've found where sometimes if you have a more measured response um, for whatever reason, maybe you're not as passionate about something. If you, if you share that with somebody who is really passionate about what they're talking about, you can produce uh, more agitation and, um, and, and as, as a result, more suffering. So, I have found sometimes rather than sharing whatever measured response I may have for whatever reason um, is, is not as beneficial as I thought it would be. And sometimes it's better, as you said, just to hold that space uh, for that person. 
uh, and not really be there to solve their problem, but just to be with their response or their feelings. So that, I, that part resonated with me. So thank you. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, don't you feel like a lot of life is just uh, remembering what you already know, <laughs> you know, and just kind of bringing it again and again so that you don't lose your own wisdom. Yeah. Um, Stephen, did you want to add? Yeah, I, I have a question around uh, negative as opposed to, and the question for me, can you hear me? Is that good? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, start again. I missed the okay. one word. So let me talk a little closer to uh, the screen. Uh, so I have a question around what's negative. Mm. In that, uh, you know, if I just go along with everyone else, where's my ethical morality for impact of their thinking? So, for example, if someone wants to strike another person, where's my, where's my, uh, and I have a negative thought, you know, how do you know what's negative? And how do you know about what the impact should be for the other? How do you trust Uh because if you don't go against things, things can happen which are really destructive too. Yeah, My yeah, favorite. that's that's a key. That's really key. I'm glad you asked that. And you know, self awareness is a delicate thing because it can turn into self consciousness, or it can turn into, I don't know, reputation worry. You know, how do you know when something is negative? Of course, you can look at, you know, the ethics of refraining from the 10 non-virtues, and that's very straightforward. But in terms of your mind, when a negativity is present, the mind is agitated. Yeah. So the content that you're saying to yourself might be a mixture of accurate observations and accurate decisions, as well as afflicted kind of responses and decisions. And it's all kind of jumbled up together. But the nature of an affliction or a negativity that's arisen within the mind is that it makes the mind unpeaceful. So it might not be clear which affliction it is right away. You know, is it anxiety attachment or is it some sort of anger or is it pride is it jealousy what's going on exactly but something's off when the mind is agitated now the difficulty is is that maybe we were trained to only act out of a kind of a passionate quote righteous anger wanting to right wrongs you know wanting to solve injustice and that's kind of our little tweak to ourselves something's wrong i must act and we wait for anger in order to act and we might even be conditioned that way you know if i'm angry it must be an injustice i must right the wrong you know and we have that kind of background thinking and it might have even served us well in a certain context. Maybe our anger gave us a voice or gave us assertiveness. What we want to look at when we're on a spiritual path is, can we expand to no longer need it? Because choices made without afflictions as obvious or as dominant are going to be more sustainable in their result. So what you want to do is give yourself the opportunity for the most skillful and creative response, you know, that can adjust and be flexible, suited to what's in front of you this very moment. When you have an affliction present, your mind closes to usually a few animal responses, which might work and might not. When the mind is not as agitated, it expands back out. And it's like you've got some air in there and more creative choices are available to you. And all of your life's wisdom is accessible to you. And you can kind of act from the place of wisdom rather than the place of affliction. So if you're feeling agitated, don't act unless you have to. Yeah, a very, you know, I guess it can help to remember a time in your life when you've been very calm, but acted swiftly and strongly. And there's definitely times in our life where we were bigger than our afflictions, we were bigger than the moment, and we were holding the long term and the big picture, and that holding made us very centered and grounded and calm, but we were still able to act. 
sometimes this happens to people like in emergencies, like with minor stresses, they're all agitated. But when things are really, really bad, suddenly they snap to focus and like, you know, the world slows down and they start making really um, amazing choices because all of the noise has been cleared out. You know, that time slows down feeling that can happen sometimes. But, uh, you know, even think about maybe a recent example is during the holidays, when we're surrounded by friends and family or not surrounded by friends and family this year, but trying to navigate everybody's varied opinions about things. And these are people that you have strong karma with and are easily triggered by, right? Have you ever adopted the host mentality? You know, the host mentality when you've decided, I'm the one that wants to hold the space so that everyone has a good time. Yeah, maybe you're hosting the Zoom meeting, maybe you're hosting the dinner, maybe you're hosting this or that, but you have a host mentality that says, right now, my own enjoyment is not the most important thing. Right now, the harmony of the group is the most important thing. And then if, you know, drunk relative A starts kicking off about some crazy conspiracy theory or something and starts agitating the rest of the group, you don't feel like it's your job to squash them. What you want to do is how do you isolate them from the herd so they don't cause more harm? Or how do you distract them with, I don't know, snacks? Or, you know, you become strategic about how can I help them as well as the group because you're in this bigger headspace. So if you, if you can try and think of some scenario in your life where you've either been in a leadership position or a service position or a combination of leadership and service, where you can touch that still and calm groundedness that is very flexible and able to act swiftly. That's, that's the headspace we're trying to get into because then you can address conflict. You can address harm. If someone's about to hit someone else, you can become like the Aikido master rather than, the, I don't know, the soldier. You know, you're still helping to minimize harm, but you're not hurting the harmer in the process. Does it make where, sense? Where you, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Just, just connected to that. Uh, yeah. Where do you get to uh, a spot that says, you know, I'm not, I've worked my whole life. I'm not totally clear. <laughs> Who knows when I'll ever be clear, you know, in my own ways. So, so uh, you know, there's always going to be some stuff on mine. And yet there's also conditions that I feel in my heart should be said no to. So I get the whole thing of reactivity and, you know, yeah. when you've got stuff to work with. So I, I see it from, from the models I work with. So I really get that's my work. But am I totally clean? So I, where do you discriminate, just, just from your, your knowledge, where do you, where do you dis, how do you work on discrimination between holding back as trying to be good, you know, so you just hold back yeah. a calm practitioner as opposed to feeling, you know, for all sentient beings, but there's, there's things that should be said no to or stood, stood against in a certain form. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's the sort of thing that we're not going to be sure of until we have omniscience, hence why we want to be a Buddha, because before we're a Buddha, everything is an educated guess, you know, but that educated guess gets more and more educated, and if you're feeling in your heart something needs to be said, and you feel it in your heart during an agitated time, and then the agitation settles, and you still feel it in your heart, go, you know, do it, right? It's kind of like once the the surface scattering agitation, discomfort, discontent kind of goes down, if it still feels important after that wave, then maybe it's coming from a place of wisdom. You know, I think that what can get us into trouble is too much overthinking and over planning the present you know we're trying to manipulate the present based on what we knew to be true in the past and thinking the last time someone was like this this worked so I'll do that again and that can be very skillful or it can be very short-sighted because you're not looking at the fact that the present moment has different conditions than that memory you have but in order to calm ourselves down and in order to like give us 
our illusion that stability is possible, we start to plan and plan and plan and plan. I'll do this, then I'll do this, and then I'll do this. And then when it comes to the moment in front of you where you're actually speaking to someone and confronting them about behavior, you're not listening well enough to hear what their response is. You're just kind of going in guns blazing, you know? So if you can, before the moment of truth of confrontation or whatever it is, think of a few different possibilities, of course, think of a few different strategies, think of what might work and then let it go. You know, so it's like you've kind of brought all of your tools up to the surface, but you haven't decided which one you're going to pick yet. You know, so you've, you've reminded yourself of what you know to be true about people and communication, but you're not kind of preempting it so much that you're tightly held on. I must say this. It's like, well, I'll probably say this, but maybe it's not going to be useful. I need to listen deeply to what's going on for them. You know, so it's that, it's that difficult thing of, in quiet moments, building new knowledge and building new skill sets and integrating things. And then in not quiet moments, just trying to be very present with an altruistic motivation and trusting yourself that if you are calm and acting from altruism, the best of you is going to come forward. You know, yeah, it's, it's tricky. All right, what is that? old um, Nagarjuna quote, I think, of um, when you're by yourself, watch your mind. When you're with others, watch your speech. <laughs> yeah. and, and honestly, trying to inject a spiritual path at the last minute, right before something happens that's difficult, is not as sustainable as if you're gently doing it every single day, good days and bad days. You know, so if in the morning you wake up and you think the purpose of my life is to free sentient beings from suffering and to bring them to enlightenment, in order to do that, I must become enlightened. Therefore, may I see all happiness and suffering as fuel for my path. And you just anchor that in and then live your life. You know, if you do that every single day, it becomes how you are, you know, rather than something that you have to like pull yourself into remembering. You know, so just really gentle in words that resonate for you every morning and then check in every evening, even if you never meditate, even if you just think about things deeply in the morning and then think about them deeply at night. Life doesn't just race by without any forward momentum. Yeah. So um, I think we'll have like a 10 minute break, um, little leg stretch and whatnot. So um, come back in in 10 minutes.